How's everybody doing? All right. Well, grab your Bibles. Go with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21. We are going to look at something today. I'm going to read a good portion of Scripture uh, because it's good. Amen? It's good to read Scripture. Apparently there's not enough of that going on in the body of Christ. That's why people get shifted off into other things. But we're going to look at Scripture because in specifically uh, the red words, right? The words of Jesus. He's, the, he's supposed to be our Lord. He is the you know, king of the church. Amen. And uh, we should be listening to what he had to say because his words are important. So we're going to go over some of these today. And what I really want you to do, you're, you're welcome to read along with us. Uh, at the same time, if you desire, uh, it might even be good if you just even, well, I hate to tell you this because... Okay, what I was going to say is this. It would be good if you could close your eyes and listen and picture what I'm talking about, what Jesus is saying. At the same time, if you close your eyes, you might go to sleep. I don't want you to do that. So if you can close your eyes and remain awake, then do that, all right? But if you can't, then just, just sit there and watch. I don't know. I just, okay, so. But in Matthew chapter 21, verse 17, because they... We have to remember, this actually happened. These, these are real people. Amen? And they, they actually did these things, said these things. It's not just some Sunday school story. It's not some fairy tale or some you know, fable or something. This actually happened. And so here Jesus, and we'll see in verse 17, it says, it starts by saying, And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany. And what you're going to see here is he just went into the temple. He was in the temple at that time before uh, or into Jerusalem and then he came out and it says then he lodged there. Now in the morning as he returned into the city he hungered and when he saw a fig tree in the way he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, said unto the tree, he talked to a tree. Right? Now you know maybe by this time the disciples didn't think that was too unusual but, you know, most people, if you were, let's say we were all saying, hey, let's all go out to a park. We're going to go to a park. We're going to, you know, hang out for the day. Here it is Sunday. We're going to go out on the park and just have a good day. And you saw me walk over and just start talking to a tree. You might think something was wrong with me. I mean, think about it. You're standing, looking, you're watching me and you're thinking, what, what's he doing over there? And you can hear me because they heard him. And one gospel even says, and they heard, his disciples heard him. So he didn't just say, never grow fruit on you here after forever. <laughs> he didn't do that. He actually said it loud enough that everybody around him could hear it. Now, I don't know how close they were, but regardless, here's a guy standing there talking to a tree. Right? If you were following this guy, you might have some reservations. <laughs> right? You might think, well, well we... You know, I gave up my fishing business to follow a guy that talks to trees, right? So, just, I just want you to get the idea that you're there, because this actually happened, right? And he says, he found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently, the fig tree withered away. Just withered away, right? And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Now do you realize, he actually said, This is, this is, God in the flesh. This is the creator of heaven and earth, you might say, right? Here he is talking to his creation, and he turns around and tells his disciples, not only can you do this, but if you talk to this mountain and tell it to be moved, it will do it too, if you have faith and do not doubt. So really what it comes down to is, man, you know, he says, even in Ephesians, 
and the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul said, above all, right, taking the shield of faith, right? Why? Because faith is that important. And I'm not going to just preach to you about faith today, right? As a matter of fact, Hebrews even says, uh, let us go on beyond the foundations, beyond these you know, basic principles of talking about faith towards God. He said we should move beyond that. That should be the very beginning, and it should, we should grow up to where we don't have to talk about faith towards God. We ought to just be living faith towards God. But I just wanted to emphasize here for a second just part of this, and then we're going to move on because this is not the point that I really want to get to today. <clears throat> but he said here that if you have faith and doubt not, then you can do the same thing. So that tells us pretty much faith is pretty important. Amen? Because if you believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Isn't that right? And nothing shall be impossible to you. If what? If you have faith. So bottom line is really what we have to do is make sure we have faith. But unfortunately, that's where most people fall short because they do everything but make sure they have faith. Matter of fact, they watch everything that will kill faith. They listen to people that kill faith. They listen to doubt. They listen to unbelief. They listen to everything else that is meant to take faith out of your heart and replace it with doubt. And yet we do it constantly, and then we wonder, how come my faith isn't as strong as it should be? And we have to realize, if you're going to do certain things, you know, you can talk a good game all day long, but guess what? If you don't get in the gym, you ain't going to grow muscles for the most part. Now, you don't understand what I mean by that. you got to do something, Right? You got to do something, exercise something. You got to do something to actually do it. You can talk about it, and that's the same thing. When I was in martial arts, you had these guys that talked all kinds of garbage. You know, they talked about how bad they were and how tough they were and all this stuff, and then they do these fancy moves and stuff that won't work anywhere. <clears throat> you know, and but they would always have a group of followers. You know, they'd open their school and they'd have you know ten, fifteen, twenty followers. You know, just depending on how big a story they could tell. And then they would pull these people in, and they would talk about these death matches they were in in the Orient somewhere that, you know, there's no photos, no video, there's nothing there, and yet they got all these big stories, and yet they couldn't, if you met them somewhere, they couldn't do anything with what they know. Why? Because people can talk it, but if you don't practice, if you don't do it, it does no good. And that's one of the things, you know, when I really, I mean, I was born again when I was nine, didn't know how to walk with God. Uh, started learning that when I was 17. But it was amazing because even then, when I started getting serious with God and started saying, okay, what is this? You know, how do you, how do you walk with God? <clears throat> even then, and it's probably because of the you know, martial art background, it probably had something to do with it, because in the martial arts, all I was interested in, I wasn't interested in art. It was about winning. It was about winning a fight. If you get in a fight, end it as quickly as possible because the faster you end it, the less either anybody got hurt. The longer it goes on, the more you beat on each other, the more everybody gets hurt. So the idea was to finish it as quickly as possible because that was the most merciful thing you could do. Right? I know that sounds strange, but it was. <clears throat> but the point was, so when I came in, I came in with the idea of, okay, Get rid of the fluff. Get rid of the stuff that doesn't work, that doesn't matter. Let's get to the heart of what actually makes it work. Because if it's Bible, it should work. Amen. You know, if it's, a, if it's God's Word, if you're reading it correctly, I'm not going to say interpreting it, but if you're reading it for what it says, and it's the Word of God, it should work. If anybody knows what they're talking about, it should be God. Right? And if He says, do this, and this is what will happen, then you ought to be able to do that, and it ought to happen. And if it's not happening, then you ain't doing it. Just that simple. I have people argue with me all the time on that. And they'll say, well, I was believing, but it didn't work. No, you weren't. Because he said, if you believe, it'll happen. So if it's not happening, you ain't believing. Now, you know, I'm not going to coddle you and tell you, oh, yeah, well, you know, sometimes God has different ideas. <laughs> you know, he didn't really mean what he said. He just said something to fill up the pages in the book. You know, no, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, no, you're not believing. If it's not working, you're not believing. So then the real question should be, what do I have to do to believe? And Jesus told us, if we have a problem, in Mark chapter 4, we talk about this pretty much all the time. But he said, if, you, if the word isn't working, it's because something has choked the word out, which are simply what he said in Mark 4, the cares of the world are distractions of the world, <clears throat> the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust for other things. 
Those three things encompass pretty much everything that has to do with our everyday life. And so one of those things, and then we always say that if we, uh, you know, a lot of times what we do in our seminars is we eliminate the sacred cows or the traditions of men because Jesus said, by your traditions, you make the word of God of none effect. So, and if you look at the traditions, really the traditions are simply cares and distractions that have been built up over time. So all of these things fit together, you know, to some degree. So we have to look at it and say, okay, what, what's holding me back? What is keeping me from having faith in God? You know, because I'll tell you, whenever I first started, it, it is amazing um, how, how, how can I say it, idealistic you can be when you have no failures. I mean, you have a 100% victory, it's easy to get really idealistic. It's really easy to go, wow, this works and this is the way it's supposed to be because you got total victory. And then you suffer one defeat, and all of a sudden it rattles everything. And it's amazing. Uh, you know, I used to, well, still do, read different books and different biographies of different people. And you have these, and this, it's the same thing with everybody. You read about Catherine Kuhlman. She would, she would come in, and the same thing happened with uh, George and Stephen Jeffries. Uh, these are well-known uh, healing evangelists, predominantly in England, but also here in the United States. And... It was amazing because every one of these people say the same thing. Oh, Robert says the exact same thing. He said, you go to a meeting, you have a tremendous meeting, hundreds if not thousands of people get healed. You can have 100 people in wheelchairs, 99 will get out. And that one will bug you. And that one will actually make you question everything else. Why? Because we live in a world that is embalmed with unbelief. There's an atmosphere of unbelief. There's an atmosphere. So we have to realize that the, the, the world, the atmosphere of the world is one of unbelief. That's why the whole world lies in darkness. Why? Because unbelief is darkness. We are the light of the world. We're to be the light in that darkness. But if that darkness starts to overcome because it starts to come in and you start listening to it more and watching it more and talking it more and having a constant being... Uh, barraged, you know, or bombarded, as we say, uh, by information that is contrary to the Bible, then automatically it, you're reinforcing that in your mind. So if you're going to have faith, there are some things you're going to have to cut off, some things you're going to have to cut out of your life, some things you have to decide how you're going to live, because it's like anything else. It is amazing to me how people think that Christianity is so different from the rest of life. And it's really not. Why? Because God had to do something with humans. So the humans are the constant, you know, common denominator. So when people are, well, you know, Christianity is all spiritual. No, that's not true. It's not all spiritual. Now, it originates in the spirit. And it comes out of the spirit, obviously. But it's not all spiritual. There is a physical reality to it. There are physical things that, that you have to do. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and do not do the things I said to do? What did he say to do? Oh, lay hands on the sick. Yeah, 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 we know that. What else did he say? Well, he said to feed the hungry. Oh, yeah. He said to clothe the naked. He said to treat your enemy good. He said to bless those that curse you. Isn't that right? Well, I don't like that part. I know. They curse me, I want to curse them back. Why? Because that feeds the flesh. Exactly. That's why you got to kill the flesh, crucify the deeds of the flesh, and do what you're supposed to do. Why? Because that's what Christianity is. Right? But we have humans involved. And so God had to do something with humans. You know, we talk about the power of God, and you look at people, you know, you can look all through the Old Testament, even in the New Testament. You had people like Moses that did amazing miracles by the power of God. You know, part in the Red Sea. I mean, just you name it. Just all kinds of miracles that happen. And then you look at somebody like Samson, and yet Samson's miracles were just as big as Moses's because it was all the power of God. If any person does what a person can't do, it's a miracle. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. So if you do something that you can't do, there has to be the power of God, if you're Christian, saying, there has to be the power of God behind it to make it happen. So regardless of whether it's parting the Red Sea or ripping the gates of a city off, both are impossible and both require the power of God. So, now the amazing thing is, we want, most people really want to just have the gift of faith. 
which faith is awesome. Like I said, it is something that we can go after because with faith, we can do everything else. Now, <clears throat> with uh, Samson, the amazing thing about Samson is the Spirit of God in him was translated into physical strength. That he could actually do things physically that were impossible. Now think about that. See, we just we read these stories about what he did, and yet sometimes you don't think about what all that would entail. Do you realize that for him to pick up the gates of a city, he did not do that with muscle. He did it with the Spirit of God. Now he still had to carry the weight of that thing, which means what? That means that God had to do something to his bones to handle it. Why? Because otherwise it would have crushed him. He had to do something to his muscles or else it would, it would have ripped. I mean, imagine just the tendons and the joints. It would have ripped it apart. So there was a, when God does something, he does something totally to a person so that it completely, every piece is taken care of. God doesn't just say, say, okay, here, rip this gate off. And you rip it off, and then the gate fall on him and kill him. That wouldn't be much of a miracle, right? He go, wow, ooh, ooh, that's bad. Okay, you know, but that's not what happened, right? He ripped it off and then carried it off, right? And then at one point, you know, kills a thousand Philistines with a sword. I mean, just, I mean, all these things that go on, just physical, the, the spiritual power translated into the physical and, but see, we don't necessarily want to do that. And so I'm not saying we should always do that. But there are times whenever maybe that it would be necessary. But the bottom line is, if you have faith towards God, all things are possible. So anything could do it. But the problem is, he says, if you believe and doubt not. Our problem is really not so much just the believing, but it's the doubting not part. Right? Because you look at Peter. Here's Peter. He says, Lord, if it's you, call me. Bid me to come walk on the water. What's Jesus going to say? He has to say, come because it is him. He didn't have to say, wait, wait, it's not me. I'm just kidding, it's not me. No. He said, if it's you, tell me to come. So he said, well, it's me, so come. And so then Peter has to get out. Do you realize what that must have been like to step over the side of that boat and reach down and put your foot on water, the waves and the wind and it, because it's all still going on. Jesus didn't say, wait, 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 hang on a second, Peter. Uh, peace, be still, calm. Now, Peter, now come on out. Come on. Because it's so much easier to walk on calm water. <laughs> Think about that, right? I mean, come on. Whether the water is waves or calm, it's still water you're trying to walk on, right? So here Peter had to step out of the boat, put his foot on the water. I mean, what did that feel like? I mean, because he's stepping around, he can't see it, and he's putting his foot back there, and it's got waves going up and down. How do you stand on that? So he steps out, and now he starts walking toward Jesus, and as he gets there, it says that he, got his, he started looking at the water and the wind. And as soon as he started looking, he started to sink. Why? And we all know the spiritual answer. He got his eyes off Jesus, right? But still, think about this. He walked on water. He's the only other person that's done it like that, right? All the other disciples are still sitting in the boat. You know, as soon as whenever Peter started going down, started sinking, you know, Thomas said, see, told you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now I'm glad I didn't do that. You know, I'm sure it was Thomas or somebody, right? So, <laughs> like this picture of John. Ha! See, Peter, Jesus doesn't love you that much. <laughs> he loves me. I'm his disciple that he loves. You know, everybody knows that. I mean, that, that's exactly how these, these guys were real guys, right? They were real people that had the same emotions and everything else, but he, Jesus had to leave everything to them. And he figured they, they could do it. Why? Because he was going to put himself into them. Now, the amazing thing is, as Peter started walking toward him, it said that he started looking at the wind and the waves, and then he started to sink. And even in that, think about that, Jesus still reached out and grabbed him, even though he doubted. Why? Because as soon as he started doubting, notice he believed, that's why he got out of the boat. But then he started doubting. When did he start doubting? When he started looking at the circumstances. When he started looking around at things around him, started looking at the wind, the storm. I mean, come on. We don't have to have wind and waves to have a storm in our life, right? Jesus said, you're going to have tribulation. He said, but be, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Isn't that right? He said, I've overcome this. So we have to realize that we're going to have storms in our life. Jesus even told us. He said, listen, there's like a guy, you know, you that hear my word and do them, 
you're like the person that built your house on a rock. You, you, you build on the rock and the wind comes, the storm comes. Hey, listen, he said, guess what? If you hear my words and you build your life on my words, you're going to have storms. He didn't say you're going to build your house and there's going to be no storms. He didn't say that. He said, you're going to have storms and the waves are going to come and the rain's going to come and the wind's going to come. All these different things are going to happen. But if you built it on doing my words, notice not just saying his words, doing his words. He that hears my words and does them is like the man that built his house on a rock. And he said, and his house will stand. But here's the other guy. Here's the same word, but doesn't do them. Same rain, same wind, same storms. Everything happens just like the other guy. But because he didn't do the words, the house fell. And he said, and great was the fall of it. In other words, it didn't just fall, it was bad. So what's the difference between these two? We all know what it is. Somebody did the words, somebody just heard them. And yet we think, and this is the sad part, is too often we tend to think, well, God's making this happen for a reason. God's making my house fall because, you know, he's trying to teach me something. Yeah, he's trying to teach you, not through the house falling. He's trying to teach you to do his word. If you do his word, your house wouldn't fall. There's no difference in this. Do you get that? There's no, the only difference is between one did it and one did not. So there has to be the point where you actually say, I'm going to do what he says I'm going to do, what I'm supposed to do. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do? Now, I know this goes against a lot of people's theology and things because, oh, you're talking about works. No, I'm not talking about salvation by works. You cannot get saved by your works. But once you're saved, there should be works that, pe that you could see. And just like James said, you say you got faith? Okay, that's fine. But I will show you my faith by my works. So you don't get saved by your works. But once you're saved, you should be doing something. There should be some kind of evidence in your life. Even the, the fruit of the Spirit ought to be in your life. How many of you know you have to actually work on the fruit? You realize that? You have to do things yourself. If you purge yourself, you know purging, uh, there's different definition. Well, the same definition, but different uses. But usually, uh, when you talk about purging something, it is synonymous with pruning. So that you actually prune plants, right? And so in your own life, you have to purge yourself of certain things. And whatever it is that, that keeps you from believing or whatever it is that causes you to doubt, actually, that's two different things. There are some things that keep you from believing. And then there's other things that cause you to doubt. And you have to eliminate the causes of doubt. And you have to eliminate what would ever keep you from believing. Amen. It is amazing to me. I've seen this so many times where people come along and the men there, they, they talk and they say these amazing things. And you're like, God, oh, this person really going to do something. You know, they're really going to run with this thing. They're really going to run with God and they're going to do things. And, you know, then they talk about, well, you know, and if, if we get to that point where we can't, you know, they talk about the chip or whatever it is that you've got to have. And, you know, it's going to become this way. and You're not going to be able to buy and sell. and You're not going to be able to do these things. And when that happens, I'm going to trust God. Oh, well, are you trusting God now? Well, no. But I will then. No, you start now. Right? If you don't start now, that's why people, well, I'll tell you what, Brother Curry, if you pray I win the lottery, I'll tithe. No. How about you start tithing, and then you won't need the lottery. Because then God's blessings will be there. Amen? I'm, listen, we've already done the offering. I'm not, I'm not pulling. All right? Okay? <laughs> and I don't know what anybody does or don't do. I, I do not keep up with that one bit. All right? All, you know, None of you matter give. I, don't, I wouldn't even know, right? What I know is this, that if you do God's word, your house will stand. Yes. You're going to have storms, you know, but you can have peace in the midst of the storm. Here, Jesus is walking on water in the middle of a storm. Another time, he's asleep in the back of a boat in the middle of a storm. The storm didn't even wake him up. And water's coming over to the point where they're fixing to drown. The disciples are all yelling, Lord, don't you care that we drown? So water is coming into the boat, and Jesus is still asleep. Why? No fear. No worry. What does that mean? Peace. Yes, the one thing he said he gave us, one definite thing, he said, this is what I leave. I give you my peace. And now, do you have peace that you can sleep in the middle of a storm? Because if you don't, you don't have his peace. And the sad part is, 
I have so many Christians that I, I talk with and, and talk with on the phone in different, in different situations, and they don't have peace. They're always concerned about something, always worried about something, always, and most of the time it's something outside of themselves. It's something that they can't even, you know, dictate. They, they can't control, and yet they're going to worry about it. And so, you know, it's funny because yesterday during the um, uh, ground level spiritual warfare seminar that I did, the webinar, I, I, I took it from a completely different point of view or a different position than what I have really heard spiritual warfare taught. Mainly because we were talking about individualizing in your individual life. Listen, you cannot dictate what people around you are going to do. You have no control over anybody. I don't care how much you think you control. You might be able to make them do what you want them to do, but I guarantee if they're not wanting to do it and they're still doing it inside, they are rebelling. Right? And they're going against it. You know, it's like the little boy that the mother said, listen, you go sit in the corner. And the little boy went over and sat down in the corner and then the mother looked at him and every time she'd look at him, he'd say, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> That's the way most Christians are. You know, we're, we, 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 we're in such rebellion most of the time that we don't have the peace of God to be able to just say, you know what, have peace. Look how Jesus lived. All this stuff was coming after him. People trying to kill him all the time. They try to throw him off a cliff. He just walks through their midst. Why? What does that mean? Total peace. Man. Do you realize if he had a, that? Why? How was he in total peace? Because he was in total faith. Man. He's thinking, this ain't how I'm dying. Ah, you know, there's something about a tree. There's something about a cross coming up, not a cliff. <laughs> right? So he knew he wasn't going to die there. So he could have total peace. He had total faith in God. God's going to take care of me. And he just was able to turn around and walk through their midst. Why? Because he was in faith. And if you have faith, all things are possible. Amen? Amen? So all the storms going on, you're going to have storms. All kinds of different things. And, but usually, in the middle of it, you can decide whether you're going to have peace in the middle of that storm. You're, you, you decide that. And see, that's the thing. Um, was it Viktor Frankl? <clears throat> we're talking about, he was a Holocaust uh, Nazi concentration camp survivor. And in it, he talks about how he uh, he, he said, you know, our dignity is the last thing that we can hold on to. And he said, we, we decide. He said, they may treat you like a dog, but that don't make you a dog. And you have to realize that how, what, how people talk to you, what they do, that has nothing to do with you. That has to do with them. And you ought to be able to have peace in the middle of it. I know it's not easy. I know that, all right? I was in the military. I had guys yelling in my face. As soon as I got off the bus, and I thought, what in the world did I do wrong? You know, come to find out, I didn't do anything wrong at that point. Did later, you know. <laughs> apparently didn't know how to do anything right, you know, for, for a couple of weeks there. But, I mean, they were all of it. Why? Because they are in your face, and they want to break you. They want to get you to react. And that's exactly, that's exactly how the enemy works on us today. He tries to push your buttons. He tries to do things to get you to react so he can make a note and go, oh, this makes him react. So now when it's a really bad situation, I'll make him react this way and he won't react in faith. He won't have the peace. Because let me tell you, faith and peace walk together. If you're not in peace, you're not in faith. Faith has peace. Faith is a rest. Faith is knowing that, you know what, I'm going to keep on walking no matter what. And you know, sometimes you just need to put your finger in your ear. You ever see the, the children when you start talking to them, and they go, la, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you. Yeah, you just need to do that sometimes with storms that are going on around you, right? And to go, I'm not paying attention to you. I'm not listening to you, right? Some of you ever have a child say, I'm going to hold my breath. Go ahead, you won't be talking. You'll be, and if you hold it long enough, you'll be asleep. We won't even mind, right? So <laughs> You can tell them. Raise four children, right? So, <laughs> so, but that's, you know, we, we have this, at times we have to cut these things out and just say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to respond to this. Why? Because I have peace in the middle of it. Because you can't control anybody else. You can't control what they're going to do. You know, I don't care what you do with your kids as they grow up. At some point, you can't make them do what you want them to do. You just have to look at them and go, you know what? Here's what you should do. And you watch them not do it, right? And you think, and then they come back later, I need help with this. What? Well, see, what, what did I tell you? You should have done that. Yeah, I know, but now I need help. Okay, well, we're here to help, but at the same time, learn. 
Amen? Don't keep making the same mistake over and over again. And it's the same thing, that we have to be able to realize what it takes for us to walk in faith. We have to realize what it's going to take for us to, what we need to cut out of our life that's going to keep us from having faith or cut out of our life what is going to cause us to doubt God. And honestly, the only thing is, like he said, these, these things that go on around us, they only work in our benefit whenever we don't look at them, but we look at what the Bible promises instead. So when there's a storm going on and you're saying, wow, Jesus promised peace, that's whenever, now you can say, you know what? That storm works for me because it's teaching me. Not, not that the storm is from God, I understand, but you can look at it and go, what the devil meant for harm, God has turned for good. Amen. Amen? So what the devil tried to crush me with, God now made me stronger Amen. because I realized how to respond correctly in peace. And now, and the worse the storm gets, the calmer you get. And it's amazing. Now, th listen, I'm not, you know, we can talk um, very, uh, what do you, I'm trying to think what, what word it would be, abstract. There we go. We can talk abstract. You know, well, the great storm, the greater the storm, the greater the peace. Okay, but then maybe that doesn't help you. But I can tell you, I've been in places where there has been a great storm, and that great storm was relatives of a dying person in your face, going, why ain't it working? Why isn't this working? Why isn't this happening? What's going on? And you have to look at it and go, you know what? God's word is true. God's word is true. This is the way it will be. It doesn't look like that. It looks like they're getting worse. God's word is true. This is the way it will be. Amen. This sickness will not end in death. Right? This is the way it's going to go. And then you have to stand, no matter what they're doing, no matter what they're saying, you can't look at them. Right? It says that Abraham, it depends on the version you look at, but one uh, translation says, Abraham considered not his own body. And actually what it says, King James says, that he considered, literally uh, the Greek says, that he, can, he looked at his body, he considered it, but he didn't change anything based on it. Now think about that. You can, you can consider it, you can see the situation, but not change your position because of the situation. Right? You're not ignoring it. Somebody says, well, you know, um, the doctor said I had cancer, but I just don't believe it. Okay? If you ignore it, it'll kill you. Why? Because it's in Christian science, which is neither Christian nor science. Okay? <laughs> I, I don't know. But have you ever noticed the cults get all the good names? That's a great name. I would love to be a Christian scientist. Right? I just don't want to be a nut job. So anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you say, why would he say that about him? I'm hoping they write me. Because if they do, then we can create a dialogue and I can convert them. <laughs> right? Why? Because I'm right. <laughs> Amen? When you're right, you don't mind dialogue, right? You only fear dialogue when you're not right. So, or when you're not sure. <clears throat> so, but you, you, you don't ignore it. You deal with it. How do you deal with it? Well, you, you see the doctor's report. The doctor says, okay, you got cancer. Okay, I see the doctor's report. Now, but here's God's report. And, and he said, uh, who shall believe our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Well, the arm of the Lord, the power of God is revealed to those who believe his report. So I choose to believe God's report over the doctor's report. So instead of saying, I don't have cancer, I don't have cancer, I don't have cancer. No, you say, by his stripes, I was healed. By his stripes, I was healed. By his stripes, I was healed. Therefore, I'm healed. Amen? Amen? So you're not ignoring it. You're dealing with it. Right? So you have to be, now, realize to deal with something means always doing the opposite right. of the situation. Isn't that right? Okay, if you, let's say, I'm trying to give you a basic uh, illustration. <clears throat> okay, if you're hungry, you don't add more hunger. You add food. The food remedies the hunger, right? So you're doing the opposite of what the problem is. The problem is hunger, so the opposite is food. Isn't that simple? And it's the same thing. So if the problem is sickness, then the answer is healing. The answer is not more sickness. The answer is not, oh, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. Oh, I can't believe it. Did you hear I was sick? Did you hear what the doctor said? Yeah, the doctor said I'm sick. Oh, I must be sick. No, now you're adding the same problem to the problem. So you say the opposite of the problem, which is what? Doctors say I'm sick, he says I'm healed. So by his stripes I'm healed. What am I doing? I'm answering the problem with the opposite of the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe that'll help, you know, because I know a lot of people, well, I don't believe in confessing, that confession message, all that kind of stuff. 
You don't have to believe in it, but I will tell you, it's working for you either way. It's either working positive or negative for you, one or the other. Amen. You know, well, I don't believe that stuff. Yes, and it shows. <laughs> we, we can tell you don't, right? Well, so, <laughs> but it's not magic that you snap your finger and everything changes, but it, faith in God can overcome everything else. But you have to have, to have faith, you have to have peace. If you're not in peace, you don't have faith. So whatever it takes you to get in peace, and you say, how do I know when I'm in peace? Whenever you don't have that turmoil going inside. See, it's not the water under a boat that sinks it. It's the water under the boat that gets in the boat. See, it's not your turmoil. It's not your trouble outside you that causes you problem. It's the trouble outside that gets inside. So as long as you keep it outside, you're okay. You'll float. But once you let that trouble outside, once you let the storm and the wind and the waves and all that stuff inside, guess what? You start to sink. So the key is to keep the water that's outside, outside. Amen? Amen. Are you getting all the analogies I'm throwing out here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let's get back into Matthew 21. Okay. <clears throat> now, so we kind of got hung up there on just say into your mouth, right? And it will obey you. So he says, in uh, verse, well, verse 21. Yeah. Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be thrown into the sea, it will be done. And whatever you ask in prayer, if you believe, you will receive. Now, you, some of you may notice I'm not using King James right now. I have King James here, but I'm also using the MEV. I've been using it a little bit more to read. Uh, just reading in, I'm checking out and making sure the accuracy. So far, it has proven very accurate, so it's a, a good reading uh, translation. It's the MEV, the Modern English Version. Uh, it's a good, easy reading Bible, you might say. And it's accurate, which is really uh, sometimes hard to get those two things together. So, he says, And whatever you ask in prayer, if you believe, you will receive. Then in verse 23, When he entered the temple... The chief priest and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Now picture this. Here's Jesus. Jesus, right? We know who he is. But picture you standing there around and going, Hmm, I wonder if that's really the Christ. I wonder if that is him. I wonder if that's the Messiah. Because you don't know yet. Why? Because he hasn't been crucified, hasn't been resurrected. He's doing some amazing things. But hey, you've got a history of prophets that do amazing things. So you're not real sure yet. So it, it was a pretty big you know, leap of faith to be able to believe in him, right? That he was the one. So here, now you're standing around and here the chief priests and scribes, they all come to him and start saying, who gave you this authority? Well, by what authority do you do this? And he says, by, by who gave you this authority to do this? Now watch. And Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. If you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. Where did the baptism of John come from? From heaven or from men? They reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for all hold John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. King James says, We cannot tell which both translations are both, uh, yeah, translations there, are both accurate. It means to know and to be able to tell, so we can't do that. Now, it's amazing because he says, watch this. <clears throat> we do not know. Then he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, he's still, now picture that, he's still there in the same city, but nothing has changed. He hasn't walked off. He hasn't, nothing's changed that we can tell. Apparently this all happened right there with him. I'll show you why. He says here, what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go to work today in my vineyard. He answered, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. He answered, I will go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? Now, now picture this. He's standing here. He's got the scribes and the Pharisees. He's got all the other people. He's got his disciples there. He's got a crowd of people around. Because you know every time he squared off, as we would say, against the Pharisees, you know the people gathered up, right? You know they all want to get around close and go, oh, okay, this is going to be good. Let's watch this, right? 
And, and you know, and they were all kind of like, yeah, go ahead, take them down, you know, because they were, you know, all high and mighty and all that, and self-righteous. And, they, you know, they were always rooting for Jesus, right? Why? Because he was the underdog and for the little guy, right? So, he says, <clears throat> which of these, uh, which of the two did the will of his father? They said, they who? The scribes and Pharisees that he was talking to. So you've got to take it all in context, right? And he says, they said, the first. Jesus said to them, now watch this, because what, what does that mean? That means that they knew. They knew that even though the people that said, I won't go, but did go, they actually did the will of the Father, as opposed to people that say, I will go, but don't go. Right? Now watch this. Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, the tax, say to you, the scribes and Pharisees, right? The tax collectors, ooh, everybody hated them, right? It's a long and undignified <laughs> career, and it's a profession in most people. Most people still hate them, right? So, some. Watch this. Truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes. Now, in, in their time, it, that's amazing, because that was like the low of the low right there. He, I mean, that's, that was the worst people you could be around, right? According to their religious culture. <clears throat> Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes enter the kingdom of God before you. Which proves he was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. <laughs> which also means, you know, as he said that, you can imagine the looks he got. You can imagine how they looked at each other and go, how dare he? talk to us like this. Because these were people that were, it's amazing, they were held in high esteem, they were looked up to because they were, you know, the highest in their, in their religious culture. And yet, people still didn't like them. Right? <clears throat> For John came, now watch this, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward repent and believe him. He said, you had chances here, and you still didn't do it. And he said, and the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to get into, and the King James says harlots, which is even a stronger word. <clears throat> because a, a prostitute, uh, the way the word is used, would almost give the idea of what we would today, you know, generally be called like a, a high-dollar call girl, Right? But when you use the word harlot, that means that that's somebody that's selling their body just to get by. In other words, they're just whatever they got to do, right? And he said, these are the people that are going to get into the kingdom of God before you religious acting people who are self-righteous and think that there's nothing wrong with you, think that you got it all figured out, and now you're, you, you know, you, and unfortunately he even talked to them, to them a little bit later. He goes into what? we generally call the woes of the Pharisees because he keeps going, woe unto you Pharisees, woe unto you hypocrites. You know, it's amazing. Jesus never gave woe to anybody else. It was only to the religious, self-righteous people. People that think they got it all together, people that never make a mistake. But now watch, he goes on <clears throat> and he says, I want to get to, yeah, <clears throat> verse 33. Listen, now Jesus starts, now again, nothing's changed. He's still standing there. Listen to another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and built a wall around it. He dug a wine press in it and built a tower. Then he rented it to the vine dressers and went into a distant country. When the season of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers to receive his fruit. The vine dressers took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dresser saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they caught him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said, again, 
doesn't say anything about changing his, his crowd, his audience. Still the scribes and the Pharisees. They said, he will severely destroy those wicked men and rent his vineyard to other vine dressers who will give him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation. Now, the word nation there doesn't mean a country, as we would think of it. It means an ethnic group, a, a different group. Basically, the Gentiles is really what he was talking to. He said, now watch this. <clears throat> I'm going to read this carefully. Watch this. Now, as a matter of fact, I'm going to read it also from the King James. Okay? <clears throat> he says in verse 43, King James, Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. The fruits of what? Of the kingdom. Do you get that? He said he's going to take the kingdom away from these people and give it to another people who will actually bring forth the fruit of the kingdom. In other words, they're going to do the things that the kingdom should be having happen in it. Does that make sense? The fruit of the kingdom, right? Now, think about this because he's saying, and, and you look at what did Jesus say? He said, when you go into a city, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you receive, freely give. Why? And tell them what? The kingdom of God has come near to you. Isn't that right? So what was the evidence? What was the fruit of the kingdom of God? Freedom, deliverance, healing. That's the fruit of the kingdom. Which, which brings what? Think about this. What if you, okay, if you, let's just pretend for a minute Jesus could just show up physically. I mean, he just came, he didn't just beam in, right? He actually came and, and said, knocked on your front door, didn't even walk through the door like he did the apostles, just knocked on your front door, you open the door, there's Jesus. You know it's him, there's no doubt, this is Jesus. He is physically there and he says, uh, you know what, I'm going to stay with you a while. And you're going to say, cool, That's, uh, I'm, I'm calling in sick. Oh wait, not sick, um, I'm going to call in some other way. I will take off, I'll take off good. Why? Because you're standing in front of Jesus, right? You're going to watch your words, right? So you say, I'm going to, I'm going to call, I'm going to take off work. And Jesus said, we're just going to hang out. He said, okay, uh, you said, Jesus, what do you want to do? He said, I don't know, what do you want to do? Well, I want to do what you want to do. Okay, well, let's go heal the sick. Let's go uh, multiply food and let's go uh, set some people free. And, you know, let's go, you know, we can go maybe to a birthday party or somebody. Uh, you know, uh, matter of fact, I know this hooker. <coughs> Think about that. That's what Jesus would be doing. Amen. Isn't that right? He said, I'm going to go hang out with them. Why? Because they need me. And they love me. Why? Because when I forgive them, Wow. I, I forgive them a whole lot, and they love me a whole lot. Amen. Isn't that right? Amen. Now, I know this sounds a little abstract, right? But if I said anything yet that doesn't sound Bible, you're awful quiet. There should be a resounding, no, you haven't, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay? No. But do you understand what I'm saying? So now you're going to hang out with Jesus. You're going to walk around. You're going to say, Jesus, what do you want to do? Well, let's go. Come on. And he, he'd probably tell you, come, follow me, and you go with him, right? Why? Because that's what he said before. So now you're going to walk down the street with him. You're just walking and talking and ask, you know, asking questions, all these kind of things. And then here Jesus just goes over. And now think about this. Are you going to worry about your bills getting paid? Are you going to worry about eating? Why? Well, because Jesus, everybody that hung out with Jesus, oh, we're always taken care of. Isn't that right? Jesus never let anybody go hungry. Never let, never let anybody die sick. Right? N none of that. Matter of, fact, when, matter of fact, he even paid their taxes for them. That's good, right? And, and sent a fisherman to go fish to get the taxes, right? So whatever it is you do, Jesus probably said, well, hey, go do that and you, you'll find the money there. Whatever it is, right? So the bottom line is, if you hang out with Jesus, you don't have to worry about anything. So if you're not worried, guess what? That means no fear. If, you, if you're not worrying, that means you have peace. And if you have peace, that means you can walk in faith. Why? Because... Without peace, there's no faith. But with faith, all things are possible. So the, one of the real keys is making sure, if you want to walk in faith, you've got to make sure you're in peace. Amen? Now, that does not mean make sure there's no storms. Are you with me? Because you can't control the storms in your life 
coming on around you, especially storms that are caused by other people. Right? You can only dictate to yourself how you're going to respond to the storms that go around, around you. And one of the ways to respond is not to respond. One of the ways is to look past the storm and say, you know what? This is how it'll be. This is what, but when you start talking this way, I can guarantee you, you're going to make people mad. Especially religious people. They're going to get real mad because you're going to start talking, well, I, you know, I don't know, can't, I, you know, I don't know how it's going to turn out. But I don't know, in other words, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I know this. At the end, I'll still be standing. Amen. Right? Well, how dare you say that? Are, are you saying I won't be standing? No. I'm not talking about you. I'm just saying me. I'm going to be standing. Now, you can be standing too, but if you don't stand on his word, you're not going to be standing. So, you know, I'm not saying what you're going to do. I'm just saying what I'm going to do. But religious people get mad when you say what you're going to do, when they should only get mad if you're saying something about what they're going to do. You ever notice that? And they will automatically infer that you're talking about them when you're not even talking about them. <laughs> you know, I think I quoted, what was it, uh, Coco Chanel a, a while back. Y'all remember that? Yeah, it's a couple of weeks ago. And I uh, quoted her where she said somebody, somebody didn't like her and they were talking bad about her. And she said, it's funny that you are talking about me because she said, or the quote was basically um, that she said, you don't like me and you talk about me. She said, but I don't think about you at all. Now think about that, all right? Now that sounds a little self-centered and we're supposed to die to self, so I get that. But imagine, according to Jesus, he said, listen, take care of your own backyard before you try to clean up other people's yard, right? If you were here at the nine o'clock, you also heard us talking about this, that you should uh, obviously take out the beam out of your own eye before you worry about the, you know, the splinter in somebody else's eye, right? Amen. So it comes down to you can't control anybody but yourself. And the problem is most people spend so much time trying to control what everybody else does that they don't even control their, themselves and they're the least disciplined of pretty much everybody around them. <laughs> and then they're talking about how, you know, you did this wrong and you did that wrong. And you know what? Believe it or not, there are many different ways to do different things. Right? And your way may not be the only right way. You ever heard the story before how they, uh, <laughs> they said they used to go to the, to the, the, to the grandparents or to the mother's house for Thanksgiving every year. And then finally, whenever they had Thanksgiving at their own house, you've probably heard this story, right? And they had Thanksgiving at their own house. The, the lady called up and said, Mom, how did you get that turkey, you know, to, to you know, fit into the pan? Because it was, and, and how did you, and she said, well, well, you know, we cut off the front. She said, well, why did you always cut off the front and the, and the, the back? Why did you do that? She goes, because our stove was small. See, your stove isn't small, so you don't have to cut the same way she did, but yet you're so used to doing something just because somebody else did it that that's the right way. It's only the right way if it's the way that has to be. Mm -hmm. Amen. Does that make sense to you? Amen. I know I shortened it a lot there. I'm trying to get this across to you as quickly as I can. But you have to realize, just because somebody did something a certain way doesn't mean it's the right way unless you find that in the Bible that it's the right way. So you can't look at what other people are doing and how everybody's doing different things. You have to look at what the Word of God says, and then you have to talk to God and say, you know what, I see this. How do I work this out in my life? Not run to everybody else. Right. Why? Because everybody else is going to have a different opinion. Amen. Right? And you can't please everybody. Amen. And that's where a lot of your, that's why many times in the middle of a storm, that's when you get caught up into it because you're trying to please everybody. Whenever you're really the only person you've got to please is God. So at some point, you just need to say, you know what, what does the Bible say? And it's amazing because the Bible, you know, it talks about things that are carnal. It talks about things that are sinful. All things carnal aren't sinful. Do you get that? You know, that's not good to be carnally minded. So if you're carnally minded, that's not good. But everything you do, eating food is carnal. <clears throat> Why? Because it has to do with the flesh. It has to do with the body. So it's carnal, but it's not bad unless you're carnally minded and all you think about is food, right? That's called gluttony. And believe me, you're not. Gluttony is just as big a sin as any of the others, right? Because it's listed there. So we have to realize that what, what we're looking at is that how, do, what is how does God want us to live our life? Because I can tell you, he wants you to do his word. He wants you to live in peace. He wants you to live in peace with all men as much as in you is, the Bible, the King James says, right? So the real key is, you know, you can be right, and sometimes the best way to be right is to keep your mouth shut. You ever notice that? Yes, it's, it, you, you think, well, but I'm right, so I can say this, right. and I need to say this. I need to fix that. They said this, and they're wrong, and I'm, I'm right, and I'm going to tell them the right thing. No, sometimes it's better just to keep your mouth shut, stay friends, 
right? And gently move them a certain direction, right? Let them see how right you are by how you live and how much better it is that you live. But if your life isn't better than theirs, why should they listen to you anyway? Right? And people look at you and go, man, I don't want the life like that person. I mean, they're just, they're wore out. Why? Because they're running from one place to another trying to fix everybody. That's exhausting. I mean, I thank God that he did not call me to fix everybody. He called me to preach the gospel to everybody. And if you hear the gospel and do the gospel, your life will be fixed. But it's not my job to fix you. Amen? It's my job to present truth to you. And then you decide if you're going to do the truth or not. When I figured that out, wow, my life got easier. Amen. Right? And I wouldn't always, oh, oh, look what they're, oh, okay, let me, let me find a scripture against that. You know? No, I'm not looking for scriptures against. I'm looking for scriptures for. Why? Because I want you to have a good life. I want you to have the life that God, that Jesus died to give you. That's what I want you to have. I want you to have the fullness of that life. He says, listen, I don't, people think, man, isn't it awesome, you know, to pray for people and God heal them? I'm like, yeah, it is. You know what would be more awesome? Uh, get them healed and they stay healed. Come on. Right? Get them to where they don't need healing anymore. Get an entire congregation with nobody sick. That's awesome. Amen? Why? Because that shows the real power of God in his word. Not, see, the other way just shows, okay, we walk with God, you know, bless you, be healed. Okay, that's great, wonderful. But what do you do with it? Do you just, you know, are, are, is this an emergency room where every time you need something, you come running in? Because that's how some people treat it. I, I get that. And we're here for you. But at the same time, that's not how God wants you to live. God doesn't want you to live from miracle to miracle to miracle. You, because you know what comes before a miracle, a crisis. And he doesn't want you to live in crisis to crisis to crisis, even if the crisis has a miracle to fix it. He, that's not how he wants you to live. He wants you to live in the blessing of God so that your life is good and peaceful, Right? And you know God well enough that you can help other people in crisis, right? But just like they tell you on the airplane, when you get on an airplane, they say, listen, in case we, uh, you know, in case the cabin depressurizes and these masks fall, you know, put your own mask on first. What, is that, what are they saying? Take care of your own backyard first. Take care of yourself first. Because if you don't, you're not going to be any good to anybody if you pass out, right. right? So put your own mask on and then they tell you, and breathe normally. <laughs> yeah, the cabin just depressurized, and you want me to breathe normally. No, my heartbeat's going to speed up, and I'm going to be breathing very erratically at that point, you know, generally speaking, unless, of course, I can go, well, this isn't how I'm supposed to die, so this is going to be okay. Amen. That's why I tell everybody, sit with me on a plane. If you sit with me, you'll walk out of here alive. Amen? Amen? Why? Because I ain't done, and God didn't tell me I'm going to die on a plane. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, but if you are going to go on a plane without me, sit in the back. Because you notice every plane crash, the tail always survives. So if you sit in a... Anyway, okay. So anyway. <laughs> Trying to help you out. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Now, <clears throat> let's keep going. So, <clears throat> now, he says... Uh, I want to get down. Yeah. Uh, verse 43. Therefore, I say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof of the kingdom. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. How many of you know it's better to fall on him than him fall on you? Right? Better to be broken than ground to powder. Right? And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, so notice they are still standing there, right? They perceived that he spoke of them. Oh, these are sharp characters, aren't they? <laughs> I think he's talking about us, guys. It sounds like it. <laughs> But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Now you notice twice here in this passage, it says they feared the people. Once with John, they said we can't say if he was of God because if we say he's of man, then the, the people, uh, we fear the people because they took him as a prophet. And they said the same thing about Jesus. So that, the, believe it or not, the fear of man helped save Jesus' life. Right? Because they were going to take hold of him. And they would have done something with him. They did that several times, right? Then you look at chapter 22. It says, And Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Now this, now we're getting, you know, I wanted to talk about the two sons that we did earlier. And it's the one that did his father's will that actually did it, that, that you know, went and did what he said he would do, even though he said no, right? You got a lot of people that say no to God, and yet they end up doing his will. And then you got some people that say yes to God and never do his will. 
Do you get that? So don't focus on the fact, well, but, but I, I said the prayer. I, I went to the prayer. When the preacher said pray, I prayed, so I'm okay. No, 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 no. Uh, that just brought you an awareness, right? That, that brought you in to the point where now you have to obey. Or else you become the child that said, I will, and you don't. And your house will fall. Amen? Are you with me so far? Okay, now, he says here, <clears throat> The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, verse 2, which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. How many of you realize Jesus is telling the same story again, just a different way? And he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. That's just, it's a terrible word, but it sounds neat, doesn't it? Wroth. Okay. <laughs> And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. What did he say? The people that should have come didn't. They weren't worthy. So go find the people that everybody else thinks is unworthy and tell all of them to come. Anybody. Isn't that amazing? Now, how much should that be telling us? How, how It's so easy to get to a place where you judge who you should share the gospel with. I was at, where was I yesterday? Anybody know? Walmart, of course. There you go. You got it. You know me. Okay? <laughs> so, so people say, how, I've had people say, how can I meet with you? Go to Walmart. You'll find me. Okay? That's the best way. <laughs> You'll find me there at some point. But we went to a Walmart yesterday. And we were uh, obviously shopping, so we was going. And then I was looking for a particular thing and couldn't find it. And so I went over to the fitting room area to ask the ladies there. I said, where is this at? And this, there was two ladies there. And one lady come around and she said, oh, okay, yeah, I'll help you. And she said, come around. And then the other girl come around and she goes, aren't you a preacher? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I am. I said, can I do something for you? And she said, I need healing. I need healing. And I said, okay, what particularly, anything in particular? And she started naming organs, I mean, things that she needed healing in. And then her family, and she named her family, and so we started going through the whole family lineage, I mean, the whole thing. So, <laughs> and, and the other lady that was taking me to what, what, what I was looking for was stood there, and she didn't know, you know who it was or anything, so she just stood there, and she's looking at this, and now I'm talking to this girl, and I'm like, okay, well, um, let me pray for you. And she, I said, can I pray to her? She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she reached out, and I grabbed her hands, and I just started commanding and commanding the change and command her body to be healed. And the other lady is standing, and it's so funny because this other lady is standing, and she goes, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. And, and people are standing there. <laughs> and so when I finish, then, and my phone rang because my wife didn't know where I was at, right? And so she's, my phone, it's not ringing, it's vibrating. And so it's going on, and I'm, you know, you, when you're holding somebody's hands, you can't really go, hang on. Father, in Jesus' name, I'll be right there. Oh, in Jesus' name. You can't do that. It's just like, hang, hang on, you know, just hang on here. And so I'm praying for this lady. And when I get down, I said, all right, in Jesus' name. I said, all right, now, I said, uh, I'm here pretty regular. So uh, next time you see me, you know, let me know how things are going. And she said, okay. And so then this, the other lady, she goes, I just was telling her, she needs to tell all the Muslims about Jesus. Because that's what, because there's a lot of Muslims that work there, especially in the Walmart that we were at. And so she said, oh, and so we were walking. She goes, and I've been telling, the Muslims got to know. They got to know about Jesus. We got to tell them about, and I mean, this woman's preaching to me about preaching to the Muslims, <laughs> right? So we start walking over, and I walk into the, the clothing section where, where, the, where the lady was. And it's funny, because the lady that was taking me to look to get the thing I was looking for, she didn't know where it was at. She had no clue, but she was taking me there anyway. So, so we walk over there, and then she sees a Muslim lady that works there. And she calls her and says, come here, come here. I, we need help finding this. And the Muslim lady came down. And right when the Muslim lady got there, now this other girl that I just prayed for, she walks up 
And whenever she walked up, she had another lady with her. And she said, I brought her here because she has seizures. Fix her. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Now, the Muslim lady is standing there watching, right? And so I said, all right. I said, do you want me to pray for you? And Because now I figured it's a you know, good situation. Said, okay. And so, okay, I take her by the hand. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Caesar, you will stop now. Right now. And I started saying, and right now. And then I use the name of Jesus like, I know, 10 times in 30 seconds. And in the name of Jesus, <laughs> right now, right now, right now. The devil can do nothing but bow his knee to the name of Jesus. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't quite that exaggerated, but at the same time, I was, I was using the name a lot, right? And so when I got done, I said, I said, there you go. I said, now that will never bother you again. And this lady was just so happy. And so then they go off, right? And then the Muslim lady's kind of standing there, and she said, what, what did y'all need? And, I, and, and so I'm trying to say, and then my wife walked past the other way, and I said, my wife, I'm like, I got to go tell, because I still hadn't talked to her, right? I still hadn't communicated with her to tell her where, where I was at or what was going on. But I'm having a healing service, right? <laughs> so, so the next thing was, I was looking for a basket for an offering. No, I'm kidding. We didn't. <laughs> no, we're not doing it. You know me better than that. But anyway, but, but see, that's, and, and the funny thing was, this one was just talking about preaching to the Muslims. That's what I did. I preached to the Muslims. Why? By action. Not just by word. Why? Because the kingdom of God is not in word only, but in power and in demonstration of the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Now, she works with those two girls. She knows them. She's going to know what took place in their lives. Right? And she can't deny that. And she was just standing there smiling. I mean, she, was, she wasn't antagonistic whatsoever. You know? So she was just smiling and, and pretty much agreeing. And then uh, she kind of found out she didn't even know where what I was looking for was. <laughs> But the other lady that was originally taking me over there, she was determined, and I was even walking trying to catch up with my wife over in the food, the grocery section, and this lady came all the way over there and said, I found it, I know where it's at, come with me. And I'm like, uh, uh, okay. So I had to follow her over, and then I found, and we, and we actually found it, and then I went back and found my wife. So, but that's, you know, that's a day at Walmart. Amen? <laughs> so, but, but I did ask her, I said, well, how did you, how did you know anything about me? And she said, well, I, I, was on, I went on YouTube and I was looking for healing because I needed healing and my family needs healing. And I'm like, well, good. And she said, but I, I didn't know you were here. She said, but I've watched all your, your, your healing series. And I'm like, okay. I said, well, I'm, I actually am here. I'm, I said, I'm right down the road because we were at the one at George Bush and uh, Coit Road right down there. So pretty much straight down here. And I said, well, we're right down there. And she was you know, excited to hear about it. I don't know if she'll come or not, but you know, regardless, we were able to do what we were able to do. Amen? Yeah. But this is life. This is how it's supposed to be. It, it, I didn't go to Walmart looking for people to, to minister to. Now, you can do that, and you can always find somebody there because, you know, it's a great place to find people. Uh, but overall, you don't have to do that either. Same thing happened kind of like it was at um, Luby's a while back. I told you about the lady at Luby's. We're walking to the line. She didn't know anything. But, and I'm the one person she starts talking about her shoulder hurting to. whole line of people. She didn't know I'm a preacher. Nobody there really, I don't guess they knew. She didn't know, I know. And I could tell by her response, right? And just took her by the hand and watch this in Jesus' name. Pain, go in Jesus' name. I said, now watch. And, and a few minutes later, she's there. And you could tell first she's like this. And a few minutes later, she's like moving around and looking all good. And, you know, and I'm like, yeah, see? As you go, just it's life. But I didn't go, oh, God, please make this work. Oh, God, you know, I got to have anointing. God, hope I'm in faith. And God, please, they could gift it. It wasn't like that. You have it. Amen. You just give it away. Why? Because if you have Jesus, you have life. And if you have life in abundance, guess what? You don't have sickness or disease. Amen. You don't have fear. You don't have pain. You don't have... You live life. Life is good whenever you have life in abundance. Amen? Amen. Isn't this simple? Amen. Simple stuff. So, now, uh, I'm going I'm to read this last part real quick just because there's a particular point here. But he says here... Um, uh, for the, so those servants, <clears throat> yeah, verse 10. Did I change? Did I go to verse 9? Go to the highways. Been, yeah, been there. Okay, verse 10. So those servants went out the highways, gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. Hear that? Bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. 
Then went the Pharisees. Now notice, well, I don't have time to get into it right now, but there is a slight difference whenever you see the term kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. You never see the kingdom of heaven taken from anybody, but you see the kingdom of God taken from. Okay? Uh, if you don't know, understand that, I actually did some teaching called Behold the Kingdom. With There's the book, it goes through all the kingdom parables, everything in it. So, now, <clears throat> but uh, basically you have the, the uh, realm of profession where you are professing Christ, and then there are those who, some who profess Christ, but there are those also who possess Christ. Everybody that professes Christ does not possess Christ. You get that? Yeah. So there are some that are in and some that are just around. Okay? We call those also wheat and tares in the Bible. Okay? So again, I, I don't want to get too far into it. But he says, Then went the Pharisees, there they are, and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Ah, let's catch him in his words. Right? And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Wow, listen to that. They are confessing that right there. And yet they don't follow him. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. In other words, you're not a respecter of people, so you don't care the, you know, the high and mighty or the down and out. Right? Doesn't matter to you. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Now watch this. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, you hypocrites? I bet they would not expecting that answer, right? <laughs> Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and subscription? Superscription. They say unto him, Caesar's. Then say at the end of them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So he was saying, This money is Caesar's. It's got a picture on it. But you were made in the, see, the money was made in the image of Caesar. Man was made in the image of God. So the money belonged to Caesar in that case, but man, God wants all of man. You got that? So he says, when they heard, had heard these words, they marveled and left him, right? Couldn't say anything else, and went their way. The same, now watch this. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, right? Which is why they were Sadducee. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. If you don't believe in a resurrection, you're going to be sad. All right, you got it, okay. Okay, I'm here all week, folks. Okay, so anyway, let's go. And they asked him, saying, now notice, it pointed out the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, right? And watch this. <clears throat> this uh, then in verse 24, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, no children, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? Now, these are Sadducees that don't believe in a resurrection, asking a question about a resurrection. Do you realize? So, half the time, and this is something I've found, most of the time, half the time at least, whenever people ask you questions, they're not really asking a question. They're trying to make a point. And they try to make the point, and a lot of times they try to preach in their question. And they really don't want an answer. So many times when I answer a question, I don't answer the question that's written. I answer by the Spirit what I perceive to be the true heart behind the question. And sometimes I don't even read the question out, but I will answer the question. That way I don't embarrass anybody. But at the same time, I'm still able to hit the heart of the person that wrote it. That make sense? So... For they all had her. Jesus answered and said, You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven, but as touching the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read that which... Was, now notice he goes right back to the resurrection. Right? Notice they didn't talk... He didn't talk about whose child, or, or I'm sorry, whose wife she would be. Right? He went right back to the resurrection. Why? Because he knew they didn't believe in it, but he did. So he went right to the thing they didn't believe in and hit that. Well, you know, I don't talk about healing around these people because they don't believe in healing. Well, then they need to believe in it. Those are the very people you need to talk to about healing, right? But you don't need to try to, you know, win them doctrinally. Win them with testimonies. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. Here's this person. Let me show you pictures. Let me show you some video, right? And you got those videos. If you ain't got your own, use some of mine. They're out there. This, this happened, right? And then you start winning them with that. And they can't argue with the testimony. All they can go, well, I don't believe that stuff. You know, how do I know that wasn't faked? 
uh, don't have time to fake it or the money to pay anybody, I'd have to pay to fake it. Because if you ever pay somebody to fake it, you're going to be paying them the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Or they're going to, at some point, you quit paying them, they're going to start talking. So it's just stupid to ever think about paying somebody. And people say, because that's what my mother in law used to say. Early, early on, she all oh, those faith healers and all that kind of stuff, that's all fake. They pay those people to do that. And then one day I started thinking about it, I'm like, man, that would be stupid. Because not only did a lot of people come out of wheelchairs and these different things, but now you've got to pay every person. If all that's fake, you've got to pay every one of them for the rest of their life or the rest of yours, whichever is shorter. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so think about that the next time somebody says, oh, that's all fake. Tell me how they fake that. Well, why would they fake that? Right? It doesn't do any good. So he says here, <clears throat> he, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which is spoken by, unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when they heard, when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Right? Now, we can go on. I'm not going to today because I've already gone too long. But I want you to realize today two things. What was the essence of everything that was said? You can't just be a hearer of the word. You have to be a doer. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I say? He said, if you build your house on my words, if you do my words, you hear them and you do them, you build your house, it'll stand. If you hear my words and don't do it, guess what? Your house is going to fall apart. Don't be surprised when your house falls apart if you're not doing the words that you heard him say. Amen? Amen. God, why are you doing this? He's not doing that. You did that. Right. right? By not doing what you're supposed to do. So you have to decide to be uh, doers of the word. Amen? Amen? So we have to be the son, that not the son that says, I'll go and doesn't go. And hopefully you're not the son that said, I won't go, and you did go. Hopefully you're the son that says, I'll go, and you actually go. Amen? Amen. Now, I know I went through this fairly quick. Well, not too quick, but... You know. <laughs> For the amount of scripture, it was quick. All right, so there we go. So, but did you get anything out of this? Amen. What does that mean? Let's start, let, let, let's slow down. Let's back up a little bit. Let's read the scripture. Read every word. Read it slow. Read it out loud. Find out what we're supposed to do. And let's get back to doing the basics of living Christianity. Right? Just living it. Right? Uh, just like in the 9 o'clock when I taught on getting real. You know? At some point, let's get away from all the, you know, energy ball throwing and fireball throwing at each other and, you know, gold dust and oils and all that kind of stuff. And let's get back to loving God and loving people do unto them what we want done for us. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, preach the gospel. That's Christianity. Amen? Let's live peaceably amongst each other. Let's live for one another. Let's help one another. But let's not try to control or dictate or in any means manipulate other people. Let's only look at our own lives. And if our lives line up with the word of God, then we become the light that draws people to change their lives. Amen? Amen? All right, let's all stand up. All right. Well, y'all cold? Is it cold in here to you? It is to me, man. My hands are like ice. I'm like, it's cold up here, right? So, <laughs> sorry about that. It's, I'm really sorry about it because I'm paying for this thing. Anyway, it doesn't need to <laughs> doesn't need to be. So, we will adjust that. Okay. I, I think, well, anyway, it should be getting a little bit cooler around the country anyway. But, because um, it was hot in Hawaii, I'll tell you that. Anyway. So, <laughs> so I look like a raccoon while I was over there. I got a tan, but I was wearing sunglasses. So, my eyes were all white or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> Honolulu. <laughs> it sounds so much like hallelujah. Anyway, so, <laughs> so all right. Father, we thank you. Your word is absolutely true. We thank you that you're our Father, that you're our God, and that, Father, that you have made provision for every need that we can have and that we experience. So, Father, today I've sent forth your word as I believe that you have given it to me. I've done it by the Spirit. I've done it because I love you and I love them, and I want to see them experience what you have for them. So, Father, I thank you now that the word that's gone forth will be like a barbed arrow that will lodge in their souls and will be there and remain there until they act upon it. So, Father, I thank you that the people before me and the people listening, both now, presently, and in the future, 
by whatever means, that they will be doers of the word of God and not just hearers. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, we say, right now, be healed. Be made whole, head to toe. Right now, every sickness, every disease, every ailment, you will hear and obey the voice of the Word of God. Go now in Jesus' name. We set them free in the name of Jesus. So be it. So be it. Amen. Amen. Now, if you've not made Jesus Lord, do so now. I'm not going to ask you to come down front. I'm not going to ask you to do all that stuff. It is a decision of your will to decide to follow him and make him Lord of your life, which means you will do what he tells you to do. And to find that out, you just pick this book up and you start reading uh, about the last third of it uh, to begin with. And that would be starting with Matthew and going through Revelation. You can start there and read it. And whatever it tells you to do, just go do it. It's real simple. And when you do that, that is Jesus being Lord in your life. Amen? Amen. So, write and let us know. Call us and let us know. Email, whatever you got to do. Let us know testimonies that you gave your heart to Christ, that you have made him Lord, and whatever's going on in your body, physically, uh, in your mind, in your finances, in your relationships. Let me know if God has, has helped you in those areas because we want to rejoice with you. So, until next time, God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Now, and my team, if you need ministry, my team will help organize that, and we will be right back. So, God bless.